it is six o'clock and I bring you the new stat. Not all appears to be doom and gloom for some industries. The streaming services have seen a boom with more people subscribing to giants such as Netflix and Disney Plus. Teleconferencing has also seen an increase of users with apps such as Zoom, who have made a total of $4 billion in the three months since the start of the pandemic. The pharmaceutical industry and healthcare services have also experienced higher activity as the world's leaders and scientists fight to find a vaccine. However, others have not fared so well. The aviation and tourism industry has been grounded to a halt since lockdowns were imposed across the globe. Hope still did not come as countries began lifting restrictions as the idea of a 14-day travel quarantine overshadowed any possibility of the industry getting back on its feet again soon. The oil industry also appears to be on life support as prices crashed below zero for the first time on record as restrictions on travel dropped demand and as storage began running out across the globe. Unfortunately, only time will tell when these industries will get back to normal levels. And here's Ellen with the weather! Thank you, Maddie. But the weather at the moment is not so important since everyone is staying at home and saving the NHS, right? Now, moving on to the report on the severity of coronavirus in the UK. A new survey of the corporate sector from the UK Office for National Statistics suggested that by mid-April, a quarter of businesses had temporarily closed and a further 40% of firms are experiencing lower turnover. Fewer than 5% of firms are reporting higher turnover than normal. Another survey conducted by a UK business organisation found that three quarters of firms had furloughed at least part of their workforce. Taking this evidence together, a cautious estimate is that the UK-wide economic activity may be roughly 30% lower while the current social distancing measures are in place. Experience from past epidemics suggests that some form of social distancing restrictions can be in place for anywhere from a few months, as was the case in East Asian countries during the 2003 SARS outbreak, to more than a year, as was the case in West African countries during the 2014-16 Ebola outbreak. In the context of the coronavirus outbreak, the UK Chief Medical Officer stated that in the absence of a proven vaccine or reliable testing and tracing regime, some disruptive social distancing restrictions will need to be in place in some form for at least a year. Now, moving on to the unemployment issue caused by coronavirus in the United Kingdom. We expect the falling GDP to have profound and potentially lasting impacts on the labour market. The annual average unemployment is just 1.9 million in 2020 under the three-month lockdown scenario, but peak annual average unemployment rises to 4.8 million and 7.2 million in the 6 and 12-month scenario, respectively. The theory is less clear about how inflation may change in the future. Both aggregate demand and supply in the economy have been constrained by social distancing requirements, making it impossible to accurately measure the output gap. The observed increase in savings indicates that this inflation is more likely in the future. This is tentatively supported by the experience of countries in past pandemics, where inflation on average was slightly lower post-outbreak. The future rates of inflation and interest rates have important implications not only for the ultimate economic cost of the outbreak, but also the sustainability of government's fiscal policy response. If interest rates and inflation remain low, the trade-off faced by governments in supporting the economy during this crisis and maintaining long-term fiscal sustainability is much less constraining. However, if inflation or interest rates begin to rise, this could force governments into making more difficult trade-offs between protecting public health, supporting firms and households, and safeguarding the government's own financial health. Now, in other news, over the past decades, since the 2008 financial crash, the gap between North and South has been particularly wide. The COVID-19 pandemic is only set to widen this gap and heighten inequalities on a number of levels. The 2008 financial crash has since crippled parts of the North, with 600,000 more children falling into poverty, and the number of jobs paying less than the living wage increasing by 11% in the last few years. With hundreds of businesses currently shut, many have said the North cannot handle another recession and cannot afford to see inequalities rise even further. Yet reports have already shown that out of, out of the 20 towns with the highest infection rate, 19 of those are located in the North. Worryingly, reports have also shown that those in deprived areas are twice as likely to die from coronavirus. 
The effects on education are also set to be devastating, with the most disadvantaged children set to fall behind their peers while schools are closed. With figures showing that two thirds of secondary schools teaching the most disadvantaged communities are located in the north, it is becoming clear that the education gap has already widened deeply. There is said to be a correlation between lower incomes and time spent out of school, and so certain economic effects may only be felt in 10 years' time, while some 700,000 children are said to be receiving no teaching at this time in school. I've been Madeline Potter, and good night. <laughs>